Today we have the pleasure of, of uh, sharing with you the thoughts and experience of Scott Dabda, and Scott's a very familiar face to some of you, but not to everyone, so I'm going to work through his bio here a bit. Uh, Scott joined the SCL in 2002 as, as the legal affairs manager, and he's been the CEO since February 2010. So. Um, fairly new still as CEO, but in that period of time, a fairly short period of time, has brought about tremendous uh, change within the organization, quite transformational change. And so he's going to be sharing uh, some of his thoughts about that process, uh, plans for the future, and so on. Um, he brings uh, to the work that he's doing, uh, honors a BA in history and a law degree from the U of S. He has a values-based, collaborative, and forward-focused approach to doing business, and he and his leadership team are championing an aggressive growth strategy in implementing uh, significant new approaches to people management, business processes, technology, and branding. In particular, we've been hearing about uh, quite, a, uh, quite a lot in the last while. Scott's a passionate advocate for federated cooperatives, which um, some of you will know has, I think it's about 275 member retails, am I right on that? 230. 230, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> um, 230 member retails scattered across all of Western Canada. And uh, very important uh, organizations within their communities uh, and very central to uh, a lot of different types of business practices, very diverse business practices. Um, and Scott is also, and, and within the cooperative movement, it's always good to hear uh, someone who works within a federation who can talk with knowledge about the strength of a federation structure. And uh, I think we'll hear some of that today, too. So welcome, Scott. Thanks, Lou. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, indeed a pleasure to uh, be back at the U of S, which I spent a lot of years here. Not quite as many as some of the faculty, but uh, I didn't get hives when I walked in, so that was a, that was a good sign. And, and the last time I, I spent significant amounts of time was down the hall in the law school, so uh, it, it's, it's great to be back on campus. It's not the first time I've been back since I left, but uh, it is, is uh, a pleasure to be here and to uh, share some thoughts with you. And uh, as, as most interesting to me always are the questions. If there's a question time, we will have at the end to uh, cover off anything that's uh, of interest to you. Uh, and I do have mics on both sides, and depending on which way I turn, apparently it, it's going to make a difference on, on where we go. So my thoughts today are, I'm going to give you a little of a contextual overview first of, of what frames my thoughts, which has been my experience particularly at Federated uh, Cooperatives Limited, so I'll give you some contextual pieces, and then I'm going to look a little bit at, at some of the, the uh, challenges we have, some of the strategies we have to position our business for the next uh, decade and beyond. And uh, thanks, Luke, because now I know what I'm going to talk about, because you told me I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our plans and some of our challenges that, that we do have in front. And, and I do see a number of familiar uh, faces, so uh, welcome to, to all of you. Good to see you again, and to uh, those I, I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you before we're finished here today. Uh, so this is the mic that goes louder, obviously, when, when I talk that way. So uh, just to, to frame my FCL experience a little bit is, is to give some background in what Federated Cooperatives is uh, as an organization. As Lou had indicated, we're uh, owned by a number of retail cooperatives across Western Canada, about 230 uh, at this point. And it's important to understand that each one of those cooperatives is an independent corporate entity. They have their own boards of directors incorporated under their own uh, uh, provincial uh, legislation. And, and that's important to understand that those are separate from federated. So we'll come back to that in terms of implementation of ideas at, at some point. So in this particular community, the Saskatoon Co-op is the most obvious. That is one of our 230 members. They'll range from the Lake Lenore Co-op uh, to the Calgary Co-op in size. So from, from hundreds of uh, millions of dollars, like Saskatoon Co-op, a $300 million business, to a billion in Calgary, to tens of millions in, in smaller communities. So we have that, uh, that piece. So these retail co-ops that own us are in over 500 communities in Western Canada. 
uh, in a Saskatchewan context, that's over 225 communities in Saskatchewan have a cooperative presence, a retail co-op presence uh, here. Um, the businesses that we play in as, as federated cooperatives, first and foremost is the energy business, is very significant for us. Our energy business consists of a refinery in Regina, uh, there are co-op refining complex, uh, our gas bar business, our bulk petroleum business, card lock business, and crude oil operations creates our energy uh, group within our organization. And I said this is an important one for us because in the last two to three years, we've invested over three billion dollars in our energy business. Um, the most uh, substantive piece was in our refinery complex in terms of capital additions there. We've also built a major uh, petroleum terminal just outside Calgary. We're rebuilding a whole number of, of corporate bulk plants, the big white silos you see for uh, petroleum out in, in rural Western Canada, and investments in our crude oil operations. So we see this as fairly central to, uh, to what we're doing. Uh, our food business, you'll be familiar with food stores, that's what we do. Uh, as a central uh, manufacturer, distributor, wholesaler, that food is an important part of, of our business, and our food stores range from the small uh, small town stores to the larger urban centers and our convenience store uh, offering as well. Uh, crop supplies is a big part of our business as well and that's seed, uh, crop protection, uh, small uh, equipment and, and other related agricultural pieces. We have a feed operation, we have six uh, feed manufacturing for animal feeds uh, facilities across uh, West to supply our retails again across Western Canada, and Holdman Building Supplies is another significant piece. That's the, the home center piece of our markets, if you, if you think of the Lowe's and the Ronas, uh, et cetera. We have uh, the, the home centers, if you will, that do uh, uh, hardware, uh, lumber building supplies. Logistics is important to us, and we often don't think about us as a logistics company, but we are. Um, we run uh, four major distribution centers, um, actually five if we count, uh, but four, four very large uh, food distribution centers in Western Canada and a large uh, uh, general merchandise as we would call it, uh, distribution center, in addition to uh, all of our trucking fleet, the, all those trucks you see out there, neither the general merchandise side, the food side, or the petroleum fleet that, uh, that you see on the highways. So the long and short of all those business lines is to give you some sense of the breadth of our operations, which creates some complexity when we try and implement uh, different strategies within our organization. Um, central to everything we do are, are, are challenges around competition. Um, we are a federation, a federation of cooperatives that have come together. And, 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 and the reason this all exists is for individual members to get the services they want. They have come together, they formed a local cooperative, that local cooperative needed to source goods and services, how do we do that? They decided to band together and create their own wholesale, so that it's a complete integrated retail wholesale system. That is stacked up against in the commodities I've talked about, whether that's on the petroleum side, the Petro-Canada slash Suncor, the, the uh, Imperials or our competitors there, as I said, on the home and building supply side, uh, Home Depot, uh, the Lowe's, the Rona's, on the food side, traditional groceries are where we play with the Safeway, Sobeys, those type of things. So what we see constantly in, in our business lines is the growth of our competitors in their size and sophistication. And the sophistication is the important part. Um, this isn't just tinkering around with little retails as we used to, uh, trying to, uh, to get people's attention in, in some very confined market. It's a very sophisticated business competitors that we have that we are being challenged by each and every day to, uh, to get your, uh, your business. So last year, and we finished up our 12, uh, fiscal 12 fiscal year here just a few weeks back, so I can't give you those numbers. But just a, again, a sense of the, the scale of, of what we do. We were 8.3 billion in sales in 2011. We had a bottom line, our profits, if you will, of $839 million. And so I, I know at least 
two thirds of this crowd knows the co-op and what it's all about. So of that 839, 540 million of it, we gave back to our members in terms of our patronage allocation. So the way it would work at a very high level, we as federated as the central wholesale, we generate the revenue we can, we make the profit we can. It's allocated back to our members based upon their purchases from us. And likewise, that goes into the pot, if you will, to use a real example of Saskatoon Co-op. And then when Saskatoon Co-op has finished their fiscal year and they have a profit, what we may call a local profit or loss, depending, the patronage from Federated is added in and we know that makes it profitable and they allocate some of that back out to you as individual members. So we've got a complete system that's integrated and what that does is we're able, at a very high level, to take a whole series of smaller corporate entities across Western Canada built into a federation that gives us the mass to compete in all the lines we do. As I like to tell our people, the unity of our federation is critical. Because if each member thought they could access vendors independently or could generate the economies of scale needed to, uh, to generate a profitable bottom line, they would be sadly mistaken. It just doesn't work that way. And, but as a group and as a united federation, we truly can have a very major impact on the economy in Western Canada. So our vision of Federated Cooperatives is to set the world standard in consumer cooperative excellence. Pretty bold, pretty bold. But as you all know, a vision is that 10 year goal that you want and for us, we want to set a standard as a cooperative that is world class in short. We want to be a world class cooperative and there's a number of measures we have to uh, determine whether we get there. But our organization to achieve that is foundational to it are the values of our organization. And I believe values are foundational to any organization. But in our case, our values are integrity, excellence and responsibility. Integrity, excellence and responsibility. And I'll talk about those next because that to me is the first overarching piece of any strategy to succeed in business today is what are your values? What are your values? And in our case, as a cooperative, we've always had a lot of values, but they've been kind of inherent and sometimes we're ashamed of them or we're not sure what they are. And, and I love when we, we develop these, we sat down with our senior leadership team and said, so what are the values of the organization? So well, everybody knows those, well, what are they? Well, X gave me these three and Y gave me three and just happened to point out that they weren't the same. So it might have been an important thing that we at least all get on the same page on what the values of the organization uh, are. And these to me are not words on a wall. These have to be the words we live by. These are the filter for every decision we make as individuals and as a corporate entity. So again, it's about integrity, it's about excellence, and it's about responsibility. And we landed on those three values, which I share by the way, uh, by our employees. Our employees, we went through a fairly rigorous process of focus groups and having them comment and, uh, and participate, and those are the values of our employees. And so it's easy uh, on one level to have the buy-in of our employee group into who we're trying to be and what we're, we're trying to do. So I think this is an important point, because if we go back to 2008, and I know there's a lot of people talk about 2008 and the economic conditions and, and the meltdown and all those things, that what it demonstrated at, at one level was how important values are in business. Or the reverse is how important not having values is in business as well. And so as an organization, we believe that we are proud of our values, they're front and center. Uh, we talk about them every day and every employee has them at their, uh, at their workstation and I don't give a presentation to our employees anywhere without starting and asking what are the three values, including Saturday at the Christmas party. Uh, to make our employees be sure they know what the values are of our organization. And what we have found, uh, particularly recently, is how important that is in attracting talent. It's amazing how often someone will walk in in the last year or so and say, we heard about your values and I find that really interesting because that's what I'm about. And we know, and we'll get to it a little more in talent management, the challenge of attracting uh, talent uh, uh, in this economy and how important any advantage you can get is and values are one of those. So the second piece I want to talk about in terms of success and challenges within our organization is talent management. 
we all know people are the core of any business. Without people, you can have a ton of strategy, but no one's going to execute it. You have to have an engaged uh, group of employees who are committed to driving your business to wherever you want to, to take it. People are where your innovation is. Uh, starts, where the creativity is to build the next uh, generation of ideas. Within our organization we realized a couple of years ago that we needed to rebuild our entire talent management structure. That simply doing it the, the same way we have always done it isn't good enough in uh, 2012 and beyond. So we are engaged right now in a major rebuild of, of our talent so management system so that they align with our values align with our brand, all of these things have to fit together. So we started with a competency-based models. That was identifying what were the key competency, skills, knowledge, attributes, that we want in every level of employee. And we define those as, uh, if you will, team members. Those are, those are kind of the price to play competencies, and we got some there like business, business acumen, integrity, uh, planning, because if you can't plan to set your alarm clock and get to work, that's probably not going to work out very well for you. So some real base competencies for our team members, then our team leaders, which is another broad group. Uh, then we have uh, what we call organizational leaders, which are, are broader pieces. And each one of those we've defined competencies for, have trained our people in those competencies, and that's the basis of promotion uh, coming forward and, and evaluation as well. But talent management is obviously way bigger than that. Um, so part of our work right now is rebuilding our, 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 uh, our recruitment system on how we recruit, how we onboard. And again, these are values-based, competency-based, tied to our brand, very clear who we are, what we are, and, and, and what we want within the organization. So that's recruitment, that's uh, onboarding, that's performance plans, building performance plans that reward the kind of behavior we want. Uh, that differentiates our talent according to the behavior we want and living the values, etc. The, uh, the next stage is the work plans for individuals in terms of their own personal development so that we can uh, differentiate again who needs what help in what areas that they want to personally advance in or if corporately we see uh, something that uh, they need to do and ultimately that, that leads to your succession plan. So this is a massive project within our organization to rebuild our talent management system, but one that we believe is very critical as a foundation to move, uh, move our business uh, forward. And again, if we can build that kind of a, a structure where people are recognized, they're rewarded, they're living something that they believe in, that is a competitive advantage for us in terms of attracting the kind of talent we want and retaining it for the longer term. Uh, the next piece, I think that's the third piece, which is real important for our success and a challenge in any organization is financial performance. Uh, without financial performance, uh, there isn't much that will get done. Uh, and as a cooperative, for those of you, who, and there aren't many in the room who aren't familiar with the cooperative model, um, and again, in my experience and, and from our country, this is a business model. And our business has to make money. Uh, if we don't make money, if we don't generate a profit, we don't have the luxury of executing all those great ideas. They will simply just be a series of ideas. And so we have to ensure that we have the financial performance within our organization to have those financial resources. And this is a little different one uh, than most organizations because we have to look at how do we access capital. Um, within a cooperative because we're, we're not out on the markets. Uh, so we either do it one of two ways. We either have to, uh, to uh, borrow the money or we have to generate the profits. And only one of those is sustainable. And so we've clearly chosen that uh, generating profits and successful business that way is uh, very important to us uh, for a longer term strategy. Also, you know, when we look at that, part of our model, we have to we are owned by our members. So we're, we're dealing with re resources that we have borrowed from our own members. And I think in a cooperative model, that makes us maybe a little more conservative, yeah. but that's a good thing. Uh, we, we structurally work to build reserves at all time. Um, we know 
that no business model allows you to completely climb this kind of a trajectory forever. And there are going to be gaps and there's going to be valleys and troughs and you better be prepared for them. So central to our financial performance as well is the, the uh, I guess it's an old fashioned way of just having some savings on hand, uh, is the reserve structure that we have that allows us to continue uh, uh, moving forward. And part of maybe again, just for those who may not be aware, one of the ways we internally uh, finance and, 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 and pursue our own capital requirements is from our members. And our members out there, again, being so let's say Sherwood Co-op in Regina or Moose Jaw Co-op, if they have excess revenue in any given year, they can invest that with us. So it's an internal system, but we use that. It's, uh, we've traditionally not called that borrowing, but it really is borrowing. We borrow from our members. It's, it's their, their money that we use to finance a whole lot of, of our ongoing activity. So often we've talked about, well, Federated, we do really well and we don't like debt, um, is that we haven't borrowed, but in fact, it's, it's within the Federation that we do our borrowing, uh, if possible, that allows us to be uh, much more sustainable in the, in the longer term. So fourth uh, piece on what we're up to and some of our challenges are around brand. And this arguably is one of the, the biggest undertakings we have uh, within our organization right now. So what is brand? Uh, brand is not a visual identity. A visual identity is a visual identity. A brand is the total sum of the experiences a stakeholder has with your organization. It's an emotional connection. If you think of brand as what your mind's eye tells you when I say co-op. When I say co-op, what does that mean? And that obviously conjures up in your mind some images and frankly some feelings, good, bad or otherwise. And that's the total brand experience that we are working on. Uh, our brand historically has been very unintentional uh, in the last while. Uh, from a visual identity part, I think we had a whole series of of logos and things out there, we've consolidated those, but we've kind of let the, the, the brand piece evolve just as it may. And uh, recently we decided that that wasn't the best way to, to, uh, to uh, present our brand to the public. Because your brand has to be something, I believe, in the kind, I, uh, let's back up here. As, uh, the brand piece, when I look at the competitors we have, and remember the size and scale and sophistication of all those, to leave our, an impression of our organization to chance is not a good strategy. We want it to be what, much more intentional. So in 2011, we went out and did a whole lot of research in Western Canada, serving members, non-members, what do you think about co-op, what kinds of uh, values, uh, uh, what are your impressions, all those kinds of things we went through in 2011 to get a good, solid feeling uh, of data-driven, research-based information on what do people perceive co-op to be in Western Canada, more than just the gut field, but real live data on that. 2012, we spent a lot of time building programs around our brand that we're now gonna roll out in, in 2013. So what did that research tell us? Well, first of all, in the visual identity, as you probably have seen recently, there's a lot of red and white and a great big logo and nothing else because that's what the research uh, told us. We went from 26 different visual identities down to one. And that one, which is interesting because when we surveyed Western Canadians and asked them to describe the co-op logo, 82% of Western Canadian people can start to say it's kind of red and white and it's some kind of a shape and I think it says co-op in the middle, 82%. And with some additional prompting saying, well, if you can't describe it, it's kind of red and white, we got that up to 90%. We are sitting on complete gold in the marketing, uh, in marketing world where we have always kind of doubted geez, that's kind of an old fashioned logo, isn't it? Something that should be gone. And, and you know what? When we asked Western Canadians, is it an old fashioned logo? They said, yes, it is. 67% said, yes, it is. But nobody ever asked the second question. Is that good or bad? And when we asked that second question, it was overwhelmingly positive. 
because it was a historical mark, something that had heritage value. Uh, it's not a direct compar comparison, but that's the John Deere. That's the Fords. We had a mark that has withstood the test of time, and that's why you see it everywhere, and you're going to see it a whole lot more going forward. We have consolidated around that. So that was interesting. What was very, very valuable was what did people think of it? What did they feel? And we came back with words like trusted, honest, successful, proud, knowledgeable, friendly, caring, and authentic. Those were the top words used to describe co-op in Western Canada. Wow. Wow. That is the kind of neighbor I would like to have, someone who lives like that. But we have never marketed that. We have never used that intentionally out there. So that's been part of our, our rebuilding of our brand strategy uh, going forward. So we have come up with three new pillars to our brand, and this stuff is just, we will be launching in 2013. Center to our brand is locally invested. We live, work, and play in our communities. I live in Saskatoon. That's where our company is. Where does the general manager of the Saskatoon Co-op live? In Saskatoon. We are right here. That's who we are. We are truly the neighbors. Uh, we are your neighbors. We create the jobs in, in, right here in, in the local communities wherever the co-op exists. So to be the local component, that is uh, core to our brand going forward. Second is community-minded. Cooperatives have always been parts of communities and have invested in whether that's the, uh, the social fabric of communities, whether that's money, uh, the profits of the organization staying right in the community, however you define community that supports that cooperative. Um, it's part of the hometown. That's where the co-op uh, lives and plays. And co-ops have a social conscience. So they're part of that community-minded. So we're, we're locally invested, we're community-minded. And the third part of our brand is lifetime membership benefits. You join a co-op, they got you for life. Uh, there's no reoccurring fees. You have the opportunity to participate in the organization, either on the democratic side and, and help set the direction for the organization or participate in the success of the business as well. And so those three things will, will frame a whole lot of how we launch our, our rebranding. And, and, and it's critical to us that what we found out of all of that, I guess, to sum it up is we didn't have to reinvent ourselves. We just had to reintroduce ourselves, and that's what we will be doing. Uh, we did a lot of research around a positioning line out there, the Nike Just Do It, and what works for co-op. And we went through 16 different ones before we got one that worked for uh, Western Canada. And this was a challenge for us, because we're Thunder Bay to Haida Gwaii, we're crop supplies to food, we're Calgary to Winkler, Manitoba, to find something that would work in every piece was a challenge. Uh, what we found worked, and a tagline has to be authentic. You can't just say, this is what we are. People have to believe it. And uh, what worked out there for us was co-op, you're at home here. And so you're going to see a whole lot of, you know, I've told a couple other audiences, so you're not the first ones, but um, you're going to see a whole lot of that in 2013, uh, starting in well, I guess 2013 is going to start in four weeks. Uh, but I was going to a flyer, actually, uh, on where we're going to start launching uh, uh, that line, and you're going to see it on a whole lot of things going forward. And that's all part of driving that emotional connection that I think we have something different to offer. Uh, the co-op, you're at home here. We want you to come in. We want to treat you like a guest. We want to be your hosts. And this is something we have to drive through every single employee in our organization. Not just me talking about it. We have put together the training modules and are taking every single employee through that kind of training. Because again, you go to a co-op and have a bad experience, it's pretty hard to say you're at home here. Or to put it on a personal level, if you come over to my house on Saturday and I really don't want you there, you can probably pick that up. Uh, you know, when I turn my back and go somewhere else and... Uh, lock you in the basement, you know, you may want to get out. 
Uh, so, so at the retail level, if we want you to keep coming in and feeling part of the organization, we want to be your host, we've got to act like that. And, and the example I use in this is, is the Disney example. You know, Disney trains every single employee in their brand, including, you know, the maintenance workers that work underground that never, ever touch a, uh, a customer or see a customer. Why do they do that? Because they understand that those people have families. They understand those people are going to be sitting in the stands at a ball diamond or at a dance concert and when someone leans over to them and says, hey, you work at the co-op or at Disney, what's it like? You want the answer to be what you want it to be in terms of your brand and that's the approach we're going to take with ours. So, so the branding piece, I spent a little bit of time on that. That's a big, big piece for us uh, to position ourselves as something different, to create a different uh, competitive advantage around our brand, who we are, what we do, that's different than just racing to the bottom on price, because that's one we can't win. The next piece, the, uh, the fifth one that I'll outline, is technology. Uh, technology is all about change, and we have to change constantly. Uh, in fact, it's the only constant we have is change and evolving and positioning ourselves for the future. And I talked a bit about our competitors again. Our competitors in terms of their sophistication around business analytics, way beyond you, what you can imagine. And I know a number of you have cards from different organizations and you are pretty happy because you earn little points or whatever, but you all know, right? That's not the purpose of that card. That card is tracking every single purchase you make so that we can target market. And we are not in that game yet as a cooperative, but our competitors are. The future of retail is customization. It's about that individual experience you want to walk in, you want to be communicated with on the things you care about, not a whole bunch of other items, whether that's trying to sell products or whether that's commentary around things. We all want, or a lot do, that customization. Technology is central to that. That's point of sale systems for us, that's all kinds of information, uh, technology to create as I like to say, if we're going to be fact-based, data-driven organizations, we need to turn data into information. Data into information that allows us to make wise business decisions at a high level and then drive that right down to personal. So technology is a, uh, a huge, huge piece for us. And it's, for us in the cooperative retailing system, it's kind of a, there's a little bit of a sad commentary when we look back. Because we've had a patronage system where we, you have a co-op number and we can track how much food you've bought or how much petroleum you've bought and how many two by fours so we can pay you back at the end of the year. And we've had that forever. But we thought we had the greatest thing ever and it did not evolve. It has not evolved. And everyone else has started back here with nothing and, and the likes of shoppers and, London, and every, you know, you all know them, have gone whoosh. And now we're still back here saying, what's your number? And, and we're still, if you will, doing the pencil and eraser approach to it. And uh, that's a challenge, and that's purely technology. And we will evolve on that one, because we have to, in terms of meeting the customer needs uh, of, of the future. Uh, the last piece, in terms of, a, a, again, overarching uh, who we are, what we are, and what we do, is I think is the co-op model in and of itself. And a number of you have been involved in the International Year of the Cooperative and, and, and some of the celebrations around that. And I found this year very interesting because it's been time for a lot of reflection, uh, looking at our model, time where people have shone a spotlight on our model to challenge us to say, hey, are you guys really any good or, or are you just playing out there in a, in a field where no one else is watching? And, and there's been a number of studies which I think have demonstrated uh, the value of the model and some of the challenges around the model as well. And from my own perspective, when I look at the, the business model and I, and I talk to other uh, business leaders uh, of pub publicly traded companies uh, particularly, you know, I'm pretty thankful for the model in which I work with them. And, uh, and the, the simple, simple, simple reason is I watch the challenge they have chasing the quarters. To try and drive those quarterly results to satisfy analysts, to satisfy the markets at a high level, analysts, shareholders. There's a very short term uh, uh, immediacy about that and that pressure to drive those immediate returns. 
And I think that's, that's, that's very challenging uh, for those organizations because when, when you look at publicly traded companies and we all know or have heard the stats around the average holdings, you know, whatever, it's, it's changed, but we all, you know, hey, I'm guilty of it too. Um, you know, we want that immediate return, so if this stock does okay, uh, we stay with it for, what, six months? And then we shift over here, whereas a decade ago, two decades ago, that was a, ma that was a matter of years. So you, you have that instability in your, in your capital structure, and I think that's an enormous pressure that I don't have. My members aren't going anywhere uh, because they own us. Uh, they have owned us, they buy the services, they're invested in the business. They use the services of the business. Uh, so that kind of stability allows the cooperative, I think, a real advantage. Because what I have, or what we have in cooperatives that others don't have, in simple terms, is the ability to plan. We have the ability to put a whole number of plans in place. And I think what's more important is we have the ability to execute the plans. So when I compare a cooperative, for example, to some publicly traded companies, and use the examples I just gave you, a branding strategy is not a short-term project. A talent management rebuild is a multi-year project that in the short term is nothing but costs. And if I were, or my board was evaluating that, because I have to satisfy the markets next week, we probably wouldn't do it. Technology investments in the short term are very expensive as well. So when I look at all of those types of opportunities that we have in, in a cooperative in short, the ability to plan for the longer term, to execute those plans is a real distinct advantage we have to position ourselves in a different space than our competitors. Now, we're not all, it's not all great, of course. You know there's some challenges to being a cooperative as well, and the, and the most commonly cited one is nimbleness. Uh, you've got that democratic thing going on in terms of your, your ownership. Uh, in my case, uh, you've got a board of directors, you've got a delegate body that all represent the owners, and they all want to run the organization, and they all want to have influence, uh, and that is cumbersome. They're right. It is cumbersome. Uh, compared to a publicly traded company or anything else. And you know what? These people use the business. They're involved in the business. They know the business. That's a pain in the backside. If you're trying to drive an agenda straight ahead, it, it is. But is it a bad thing? And that's the real question. And I'll take us back to 2008 again and what some of the challenges were to organizations and, the, and, the, and their governance structures and the oversight. Um, you know, if that's the worst thing I have to deal with is answering questions about what we're doing, that's probably not that bad, and, and we, can, we can live with that challenge. Uh, but I can tell you, for those who are not used to the model, it's a very tough thing to wrap your head around as we bring new people into our organization. It's like, we've got to change all this. No, no, that's pretty fundamental to, to who we are. It's, it's, we have to, to move, but we can't change the model. The integrity of the model is critical, and I would suggest that it's just good governance to have that kind of oversight, to have that kind of responsibility to members, and most importantly, that kind of accountability uh, to the, your members or your shareholders or however you put it. So I would suggest that although that is a, a challenge within the cooperative model, and the way around it, uh, or to minimize the, the impact on the business is around alignment, is that if Everyone in the organization, top to bottom, east to west, understands the values. If everybody top to bottom understands the vision, if everybody understands the brand, we are all on the same page. It's amazing how quick you can make decisions. And I would suggest within our organization, there are times we can't move fast enough. But there is never a time that I have yet experienced where we didn't get done what we needed to because of the delays within the governance model. It's always worked its way through. And I would, uh, from my experience anyway, it's been a very, very positive piece. Challenging, but very, very positive. So, in short, uh, to tidy this all up, uh, our organization, give you a feel for it, we're in uh, some transition. We've got a lot of major projects on the go. We've got a phenomenal history. 
But as I tell our folks every day, less looking in the rearview mirror, more looking out the windshield, what's coming at us. We see huge challenges coming in terms of the competition that's going to eat our lunch unless we do something. But we're preparing for that with very foundational pieces around branding, around technology, around putting our people in the best place they can be, focused around values uh, with the financial stability that we have within our organization. We can take those competitors on as a federation, united, we will win in the longer term and we're going to be chasing a very different customer than the average, uh, if you will, competitor that we have. So that's my overview. I thank you for your time, your attention and more than uh, happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, who's gonna kick it off? Now normally, because I'm a big Habs fan, Big Montreal Canadiens. So there's always somebody with the Toronto Maple Leaf thing on that I can pick on. So I'm not a Toronto Maple Leaf. I have a couple of questions. I'm interested in what the so that the new brand is going to be that co-op logo with the writing underneath. I'm just interested in what it's going to look like. Is the writing red? Is it a a, a, a flowing font? Is it the same font as the co-op extension? I'm, I'm just curious about what's going to look like. Stay tuned. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can tell you. We're, yeah. 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 No, it's not, it's not there yet. It'll come out. No, we're, we're very clearly, we're, uh, we're locked in on red and white. Those are our colors, uh, if you will. We want to own red and white in the retail spaces we play. Uh, those have been traditional colors for us, which we know, uh, know work for us. The shield is, is central. We will use word marks in that. And uh, in terms of the, the tagline around where we're going, you will see co-op, you're at home here uh, underneath. Uh, just on a, on a very, on a micro level, for example, we've, we've redone all our store brands products as well. If you will, all our private label. Uh, we need to reposition those in the market. We had a whole pile and we were all over the map, but you will see those. Uh, uh, we are launching, uh, God, how many? I think we had 13 or 14 different things going. We're down to a couple which will be our co-op gold, which will be multicolored, but it'll be gold. And then co-op sensibles with a C. And that's our new uh, uh, value uh, piece. And those will all be red and white products. So they'll be very visible uh, in terms of those. And then we're doing uh, uh, market town for all fresh stuff and then our care plus in, in the pharmacy. So we'll have four, but in a, a traditional food store, you'll see three and everything else. Uh, there you go, she's got, uh, Daphne's got them right there in terms of, uh, of what our new logos will look like on, on, that's just on food items. So the short answer is red and white. Oh, interesting. So my second question is related to this. I'm just wondering, um, have all your 230, you're talking about the, the, the business of democracy, have all your 230 owners bought into this? Like is everybody thrilled with this and happy? No. I, I, no, I can't answer that. Uh, and that's, uh, this, no, that's a very good question for this reason. Um, to drive, if this was a traditional petroleum company, a traditional food company, we would make the central change and just that's it. You're done. This is the way it's going to look. We can't do that because of all of our independent owners out there. What we can do is on, on things like this, there are no choices. Uh, if we're going to do the volumes we need to make a label change, that's what the product looks like. So if they want to have, uh, you know, Sensible's Ripple chips, they're going to be red and white and that's what they are. So on the product side, it's, we can drive that uh, and have to drive it that way. There's, there's no other way we, we, we would do that. On the actual visual identity of facilities, uh, the unity of the Federation is, is key here and that's where we talk about everybody trying to buy in. And it's, 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 it's a show and tell. Uh, uh, the way we're approaching it is we're gonna show you the value of this. We're gonna show you how good it, it, it works. We're not just gonna tell you. Uh, you've gotta figure that out for yourself. So as I stand here today, and as I stand here five years from now, I'm sure everyone in the room will come to me and say, yeah, I saw a store in some community that looked different and had a different logo. And that's, you know, our largest member is Calgary and they have a different visual identity. Um, and there's not much I can do about that unless they choose to come along the way we've gone, the way we're going. Now, Calgary, as of half a year ago, 
uh, has decided that they are going red and white at least. So we're getting a little closer, we're bringing the walls in a little better and, and my argument simply is look at who your competitors are. And if we unite as a federation, we've got a mass that can play. If we fracture, fraction ourselves up into 230 different looks and feels, uh, I don't like our chances. So, so no, they're not all necessarily bought in. I, I hope they all do in time. But uh, you know, the, the analysis we've done of the market and where we need to be is this is the direction we're going to try and lead everybody. I'll go there, then I'll go to Michael. When I'm, when I'm at the co-op in, in line and I'm listening to the person at the checkout asking for the co-op number, and if someone doesn't have a co-op number, I notice that I've never heard them say, would you like to be a member, or would you like an application form, or anything like that. I've never, they always just say, okay, and go through. And that'll vary by co-op, depending on what co-op. It'll vary on who the staff member is, particularly. That's... You know, I, I, we at Federated don't control that piece. That's the retails themselves. So it's, it's uh, you know, I, I really can't comment on, on what that individual experience would be because it will be different in, in every co-op and it might even be different within the same co-op. Uh, I don't know. And I saw Michael back there first. Well, I, I guess I, I, have, I have a little follow-up up on that. You know, I guess it seems to me FCL Federated Cooperative Limited must have some views on whether their co-op members should be actively building their membership base. You have views on many things, Scott. I mean, it would surprise me, this is a central aspect of co-ops and your, your <coughs> potential marketing advantage. So I, I, I imagine you do have views, and I have the same reaction, you know, going around. I, I merely asked if I want to be a member. Uh, and So I, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether membership is a strategy which could be used to build this federation, and if so, how? How that's going to happen? It doesn't happen, you know, we just did a survey ourselves, right? You've, you've probably heard that we're in the middle of analyzing it. We find that people come to co-ops by many routes, but a lot of it is, is historical, right? Uh, it, it's because of family or, 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 yeah, it's almost an inherited status for a lot of people. And so the question is, how will people come to membership now in 2012? Probably by other routes. And the question is, how, how that can happen? And uh, so that, that's, that's sort of a follow-up on that. The that question I was going to ask you, which isn't a follow-up, oh, and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you, you know, let you, I know you can handle two questions at once, but I'll, I'll say this one quickly. Co cooperation among cooperatives is a, is, a, is a ICA principle, International Cooperative Alliance principle has lots of meetings and it has lots of possibilities. Uh, one of the ways might be that we look to other co-ops to help us think about how we reposition ourselves in markets. And I, I'm interested in whether you look to any other co-ops around the world uh, as sources of ideas or as collaborators or uh, you know, in, in, in any of these kinds of projects that you're doing. You mentioned Disney, but you don't mention other co-ops. So I'm interested in whether there are other co-ops that are models. Okay, hey, you guys got an hour, right? <laughs> no, very complex questions, Michael, and, and, and let's uh, break them down, go back to the, the membership piece. Absolutely, membership matters. Uh, that's core, that's fundamental to the model. Um, what we see um, at, a, at a high level, I'm gonna go back to branding here a little bit as to, to get the new member. Uh, we understand the history and what's brought people in the past. We know that the sense of obligation, because my father was a member, is an okay one, but there's gotta be something better. And I use the words that emotional connection. And, and, and if you will, it's all about our rebranding ourselves and telling a different story. And that story is, we, we know people care about their communities. We know that. People donate to their communities, their time, they write checks to uh, minor hockey, they write checks to religious organizations, political parties. All these things aren't just bottom line driven or they wouldn't do it. They do it because they care about something. Those are the people we want. Those are the people we're going to target. They care about their community. And that whole narrative that we have to build as a cooperative retailing system in Western Canada is if you care about your community, your home is at the co-op. 
And our words are intentional around hometown and you're at home here and that, and we know it resonates as well, is that, you know, you might have to pay an extra five cents on your can of beans. I don't know, you might. But if that company makes a profit, it's gonna be in your pocket or in your community pocket or part of your community piece. It's, it's all about, as I said, that pillar of our brand that the community invested. Locally invested, community minded, that's how we want to appeal to the emotional attachment that we want to make with new people, particularly young people, which we know values are critical. And by living our values and appealing at that, we think we can drive to a whole new demographic that are going to be committed for not just because dad said so, way past dad's time. And it's to rebuild that emotional connection. So, so that's piece, a piece. Uh, in terms of our whole digital strategy, our whole social media strategy, we've recently hired a whole series of people in these areas. We're gonna be approaching this very different than we have traditionally. And again, it's a drive to another generation. It's a drive to, to make that more accessible that you don't have to, you should be able to go online and become a co-op member in 2012. And we will get there, we're not there yet. That's part of the technology piece. So membership is, um, is critical and that's how uh, we will, what I hope we can build. The challenge we have in certain markets, in the urban market I understand uh, there's some green field for us. In a lot of the rural markets we don't have that much green space left. Uh, most people out there frankly are co-op members. Uh, so to drive to membership there there's a different value proposition, I think, that's grabbing them. And a lot of it in, in and I'm getting real rural, just in terms of an agriculture setting, for example, it's, uh, they know us because we're a major player there, they know us because we're investing back, uh, and they know us because they're getting a check. And that's a big part of driving and continuing that membership there, and we don't see uh, much leakage on that one into the future if we can continue to keep our presence. But urban is a, is a little different animal. And it's, and it's a unique piece for us because, okay, we don't really play in Edmonton right now. We're trying to. Uh, Lethbridge, we have no presence. Winnipeg, we do uh, on, only on petroleum. So, so there's an urban strategy there that we need uh, to get at what you're saying in terms of driving uh, more membership. Uh, the second part of your question, see, I did remember it, was uh, cooperation amongst cooperatives. And uh, you're right, and I, and I know my first uh, annual meeting as CEO I frame the challenges to our membership as the opportunity lies in the bottom three principles. And one of them was cooperation amongst cooperatives and, and there's a whole line of where those, those work uh, for us. That's the other part was the community piece and, uh, and, uh, and education training and, and development. So in our backyard, we haven't been very good as cooperation amongst cooperatives. And that's where I frame the whole unity of the Federation. We haven't talked like that before, is that we at least have to figure out how to help each other as cooperatives first, uh, if you will, within the fork before we venture out too far. And so I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of, of uniting ourselves or making the case uh, on our brand and on a number of other initiatives why we all have to fit together for economic reasons. The heart of your question was looking at external, and yes, we have looked external at other cooperatives, in particular the British experience, um, and where they've gone in some of their initiatives, where they've gone right, we thought, or where there's been challenges. Uh, in fact, we just met with some officials from over there. We had them out uh, in our organization for a while here just recently, and we're bringing some more back in March. Uh, so yes, we're, we're aware of some of the other success stories out there, uh, particularly I, I know I've used the word brand a lot, but particularly in brand. And when we look at the UK experience and that as, as the creation of the cooperative and how they've used that, and, and for them it was different experience, bringing a whole bunch of pieces together. Uh, they didn't have one logo to unite around. They didn't have one particular set of values. They had many, so they had to reintroduce something new. So that's a bit of a difference, but fundamentally, uh, at the core of all that, and, I, and this has been validated and we do talk with others, is the why. Why do you do all this? And we've articulated it a little differently than others, but it's, it's, it's about creating that value for the members. So long answers, very good in-depth questions. Yeah. So I'm wondering about how bringing it back within Federated itself 
how do you align, because you talk about recruitment and you talk about marketing and branding and these kinds of things, how do you align? Because it seems like a lot of it is quite aligned internally between different functional areas. How do you ensure that? Um, is it sort of a, um, like, at what, how are you aligning? Well, I thought you were going to give me the answer. <laughs> <laughs> or, give, or give me a multiple choice, which one could I pick, which one to work from. Uh, it's a huge challenge. Uh, our organization, again, uh, just looking at the depth and breadth of our business lines, historically, petroleum did what petroleum did. We were very siloed within our organization, and that is just the way it evolved. Uh, one of the first things we've done is try to break down the silos. So that's cross-functional teams, creating a whole number of projects and forcing, frankly, a representative from another group to come be part of it. And guess what? They found out their synergies and we found out this. So, so the alignment starts, uh, we've never had a stated vision in our organization until a couple years ago. So you gotta start at the high level. We're all trying to set a world standard here. Really, yeah, we are. And we repeat it and we repeat it, values. And, uh, and I'm very confident that I can take any of our employees, and I tested this right at the CGA meeting where Mr. Hansen was, and there was a couple of our employees in, and I called them out and said, can you tell, tell me the values of the organization? And thank God they got them right. So. <laughs> and that was a one-year employee, a person who had been us one year. So I think we're doing a pretty good job of understanding this is how we, what we expect as individuals and as a company when you're making a decision, when you're treating uh, or talking to a vendor or talking to a retail, we expect you to live by the values. That's who we are. So I think you start at those very high level uh, defining what the rules of the game are. Uh, in terms of the alignment, our competency model is critical to that. In terms of what competencies do we value at what level in the organization, and we've worked those out again. We, how did we do that? Well, the senior leadership team sat around for two days and said, well, this is what they are, but that would have been interesting, but that's not what we did. The senior leadership was there, but there were 30 other people that were randomly picked throughout the company. Uh, okay, maybe not so random, but uh, kind of random. They weren't all director level, they weren't all manager level, but they were, if you will, uh, as I've, and I'm doing this again in, in another week, I tell all the VPs, you can bring a friend. You pick someone you think can contribute to this kind of a discussion. And so we had, right from the start on the competency model, we had champions, and we're using the concept of champions to drive a whole number of things through our organization. So on the competency piece on which ones matter, and I was paired myself with a four-year employee from our environmental sciences division who was 29 years old. And we debated, is this the right one or is that the right competency? And then we did it as a group. So those kind of things build alignment. We're going through a whole new corporate performance uh, system right now, we've completely rebuilt our business planning structure. We're training people in, uh, we're doing a lot of training. We created an organizational uh, development division, staffed that up, that's been, been a big piece of it. Uh, you know, we're just going through goal setting for individuals right now and uh, we have I think 40 some people trained as peers across the organization. They're running those sessions. We don't have to do them from anywhere else. They trained and some of them are pretty nervous and scary but we're, we're Developing capacity, we hold people capable, they go in, they do it. So, so the alignment is coming because we're, I think we're involving a number of levels. It's not hierarchical in how we do some of this cross-functional work. Um, it's, it's all in the context of brand and vision and values and we've got the, if you will, the walls around in which we're gonna play. Uh, you know, our, and, and I'm talking solely at Federated, I can't talk retail yet. Uh, are they getting it? Uh, as I like to say to the board, it's not perfect, but it's progress. We're directionally, we're getting there. So uh, we, if we stay on message, we'll be okay. The retail section is a whole next step of trying to deliver that out at retail level. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship with Edwards. And I know FCL is a sponsor of the Cooperative Education. Uh, has that been a useful tool in terms of identifying talent? Um, and the question around the relationship with Edwards, because we had none, I think, before. And, uh, and uh, has, it been, has it been beneficial? Absolutely. We've, we've been doing stuff with the students' uh, society. I think we, we sponsor the student society to, as in our, we can't play the same role as some of our competitors in that space. And I don't mean other retailers, you know who I'm talking about, because they sponsor everything. 
And we don't have those kind of resources, nor would our members be all that excited about us doing that, particularly you know, our largest members from Calgary. And why are you taking our money, which you're holding and pounding it into your home city? Well, there's a good answer. It's because the majority of our employees are here. Sometimes they accept that, sometimes they don't. Our second largest member is in Winnipeg. So, so that's part of our challenge. So the, 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 the road in for us was, it was the student society as a start in terms of increasing our profile, the cooperative education piece, which I think, are we the largest? We are the largest. Uh, and we have had over the, uh, the last number of years, uh, incredible students come through. Uh, I think we've given them a first class experience. Uh, they've been top notch students and I know we've hired a whole <coughs> bunch of them. Um, yes is the answer. We have to, God, you know, you want people to come work for you and we didn't have a sign on our building. They couldn't even find us if they wanted to. Uh, so our presence, and that's part of our social responsibility strategy uh, on one level, but it's, it's, it's very uh, meaningful in terms of our recruitment and our retention, is we need to be, if we're community minded, we need to play in the community. And so you, you see us doing some different things than we have historically, and most recently is the, the potash uh, cup presented by co-op for, uh, for the university cup coming up. And that's, again, it's a local event and different than all other of the, the cups we have, whether it's Grey Cup Memorial or, or the Briars, is because there's no national committee. It's a local thing and that fits our value system. So that's where we play. So our profile, uh, I think, has changed in the last, uh, recent past and we need to continue to be that pillar of the community that uh, uh, if, if that fits obviously our brand that's what we have to be. Uh, my question is the co-op is a very committed member is own a co-op so probably chapel organization development perspective challenging for <coughs> This group thinking, because everyone thinking co-op is valuable and great. So how you introduce new idea or new thinking that usually corporate cooperatives didn't think that way? How you introduce uh, what your skill to associate the, the old style co-op idea, bring to new idea? And the other question is, as a customer and kind of diversity issue. When I come to Saskatchewan, first people recommend if you want to get your international food, go to Superstore, not a co-op. So, and then Saskatchewan is quickly changing. So lots of new newcomers coming. How you receive that is a sign for change and how you relate with that. Very good questions. Um, oh, that was loud. In terms of, uh, and I'll deal with the, the last question first. On, uh, it's excellent observation, um, and we know that. In terms of the changing demographics of our markets, uh, but here, here's the perfect challenge. In the urban centers, we can see that change. And is, food business is all about volume. So you've gotta have the capacity to, to, to generate the volume. Um, in certain aspects of Calgary, we know where there's an ethnic diversity and we can, in fact, we've, Calgary Co-op has converted a couple stores to be dominant in terms of ethnic uh, diversity because uh, that's what's required. To do that in Wynyard, Saskatchewan is a big challenge for us uh, to have the kind of turns we need to make it profitable. But there is no question that the demographics are changing uh, within uh, our markets. Uh, we have a uh, international foods uh, division in our food department. It's only six months old, so I, I don't want to claim that we were way out in front of this one because we weren't. Uh, but we're there now and we're looking at that as to how do we service uh, the very changing demographics, particularly in urban centers. And I also think it's more than just servicing particular uh, ethnic groups. Uh, I think whether it's the food channel or whatever, people are much more experimental in the kinds of uh, of, uh, of, of dishes they're prepared to try and, and, and so there's a, there's a market there for us. Um, but can we compete with the superstores, the Loblaws group, uh, on the kind of volumes they can buy and source materials? It's very difficult for us, but we, we have to try and we're gonna try. 
Uh, I know the Overweighty Group in Vancouver has set up very specific stores. They call them East Meets West stores, where over half are ethnic. That's pretty tough for us to do. We don't have that kind of, uh, of, of a demographic. But you identify uh, at a retail level a trend that's different, one that we're not good at, and one that we're going to have to get, uh, get better at. Uh, sorry, what was the first? Oh, uh, introducing change. Uh, fear is the best way to get people to do it. No. <laughs> No, you're right. You know, if we talk, as we say, uh, and I always like to say, if we, we talk on the island, if we're an island, on the island, everything's great. Uh, but not everyone's on the island. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. We, we, we need to challenge that assumption. And, that, and the way I've put it to our people, uh, and it's not a fear thing, it's, it's people are coming onto our island uh, and challenging our model, first of all. Um, and, it, and there is a bit of fear in, in terms of look out the windshield. What is coming at us five and ten years from now in terms of what competitors are doing, where technology is going, are we there? And for us to sit and rest on our laurels is a very big mistake. And that's a message I have delivered to our management team over and over and over. This isn't about fear. I don't want it to be about fear. It's about preparing for the future. And uh, we all understand our model, we all appreciate our model where we work, but if we want to sustain the model, we need to leave it to the next generation. And I feel an obligation that we leave it in better shape than the way we found it. And so if we continue to look out the windshield at what's coming at us and preparing for the future, I am confident, and if not, I'm going to be in big trouble, uh, that the majority of our management team and our general managers at our retail co-ops follow that argument and understand we have to change. And I don't mean scrap the model or anything like that. It means we need to reposition ourselves. You know, if we want to see challenges to, to our business, you know, we're, we're fundamentally retail. What happens if everything starts to move to e-commerce? And there's a whole lot of that. We know in the rural, even in the rural, where farmers are going direct uh, online delivery in the farmyard, they don't need that retail facility in the middle. That's a big challenge for us. So we better start preparing and how we're going to address that and what else we can offer for service, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and another part of our model, which we've had a great advantage with, which is the community piece, that we have a social conscience, we're, we're different. But, and I know some of the academics don't like going to other academics, but uh, strategy, Michael Porter, he's the strategy dude, everyone knows out of Harvard. And I heard him not long ago here, I saw him, and the whole approach him and his team are working on is corporate social value. Is there's a whole new concept of using a publicly traded company to solve uh, society's problems by creating corporate social value. So the long and short of that is if we think as cooperatives we've got the market cornered on being good people and part of the community and, and there's a whole wave coming at us that we haven't even thought about yet. And we have a natural advantage because of our own ownership structure and we better use it because it's no different than that co-op number thing. If we sit and wait, everyone will blow right by us again on, on something that's central to our model. So, so it's a challenge. No, Daphne right here. No, no, I, I was taking one more question. Okay. Oh, you were going to... I was going to... Okay, you do whatever you need to do. You're in charge. <laughs> You're the dean. I'm in charge. Of your <laughs> <laughs> I would like to, to enhance the reception, but if there is another question or two, let's do that. Sure. Okay, I'm, um, I'm, just, I'm curious about the students that come from the end of the school to you. Um, are they aware that they're coming to a different type of business, or do they think they're just coming to another business and they're going to do this and hopefully get a job? Or do they do they know they're coming to a co-op? Very good question. At the, and I don't know if others do this or not, but we always bring our students together after the co-op internship. We sit them down with the entire senior leadership team, uh, have a little snack and chat, and we always ask them the one question. Did you know anything about the co-op model before you came here? And the answer is almost always no. Um, they may have some general idea if they come from rural Saskatchewan. They may say, yeah, you know, I know a little bit. Uh, I know it's something, it, but 
in terms of understanding that there's a different play, very, very, very little knowledge of, of that it's a different business model. Uh, I'm optimistic that as we continue to evolve here, that answer is going to change. Uh, and I think our presence is, uh, is, is starting to change. And part of that is when the students come back. I know they, they're, they're, we have some peer education taking place here about what it was like there and that in fact it is a business and geez, they're kind of a large one, aren't they? They're like second largest in the province, 51st in the country, da 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 da. Which by the way, that puts us on the scale of Honda, General Motors, those are the two on either side of us, Honda and General Motors. So, you know, it's a pretty big business right here in, in Saskatoon. And we're even higher ranked if it comes to profitability at 46. So, uh, no, they don't generally know that. Uh, they're, uh, right now, I think there's more attraction because we have a good reputation for a good experience. And that they're gonna get, they're not gonna be photocopying. They're gonna be doing work and participating in projects. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge because there's, uh, uh, I will be very happy the day when they all say, yes, we came here because we knew it was a different model and we, we understood it. So that's a big challenge. You'll let me uh, continue. Uh, Scott, thank you for all these really careful answers and, and thoughtful. I, I was in Manchester. I was, you know, the year of cooperatives, so I, I got to travel more than usual. Even and I was in Manchester at a conference called Mainstreaming Cooperation. Manchester, as you'll know, is the home of the UK Co-op Group, and it's just down the road from Rochdale, which had very good publicists. So we all think that that's where the Co-op movement was founded, but it wasn't. But that's, they, they had good publicists. But uh, I was in a session about the renaissance of housing cooperatives in in the UK. Uh, and there was a fellow in there that said something that, I, that really stuck with me. Uh, he said that the original project of co-ops was to make sure that consumers didn't get hurt, that they got a fair deal. And so on. You know, he was tracing it to Rochdale. And he said today that the project is much more expansive in some ways. The challenge is more expansive. Uh, it's about consumers, it's about producers. But in 2012, it's fundamentally also about the environment. It's, it's about creating enterprises which are, in some ways, providing a positive rather than a net negative effect on what we all know is, is the ultimate community we live in, the biosphere, or you know, the, the, this very small little planet that we are. And it, it always struck me, and, and, and you know, I ask this in all sympathy, really, that, that co-ops are in a tricky place, really, because they, as you say, you're in retail, but you're in retail providing inputs to agriculture, and you're in retail providing groceries and building products to increasingly green conscious, you know, well, at, at least somewhat green aware uh, uh, consumers. And, but you're also in the petroleum business. And as I say, I ask this as someone who, who, who doesn't have an answer to this question, but I'm interested in how you're moving that forward. Because if you talk about stealing a march, and you also talk about the co-op potential, this is another big one, I think, uh, where the competitors are positioning themselves. And the co-op potentially has, can, can outdistance them tremendously on this one. But, but it has some challenges. And I'm interested in how the, your organization is thinking about that. Another very good question. And we are thinking about it on, on a number of fronts. Uh, you know, if it's just, you know, straight social responsibility, we, you know, we, we're, we will be rolling out a new strategy in 2013 on that that includes all components of it. It's not just philanthropy. It's not just environment or, or financial, the, the, complete, uh, the complete piece of that. Um, we have always been conscious of our environmental footprint. We have never told our story. Uh, yeah, Walmart changed some light bulbs and everyone knows. Uh, we've been doing that forever. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a whole we care part of our strategy uh, that we will be rolling out next year in terms of what we do and how we source and, and all of that piece because sustainability uh, for us in, in the broadest sense is, is, a, is a big challenge for us. And we haven't thought enough about it. Uh, that's the long and short. We have not positioned ourselves well on that. And you're right. There's another one where we were getting outstripped 
by competitors who should never outstrip us on, on that one. Uh, on the petroleum, the ag side, um, uh, you know, our members, uh, at the end of the day, we are a cooperative and, our, and ours are those retails and they live off of the petroleum and uh, that's not going to change in the short term. Uh, the threats, obviously, uh, is to do that as, you know, as best we can. Uh, we're in the midst of a major wastewater improvement project at our refinery, for example, which will keep all water on site and be used and recycled. Well, I got a board member here. I don't even want to tell him what it's going to cost, but the last he heard was 150 million. Well, that's a lot of cans of beans. It's a lot of cans of beans to get 150 million dollars to have a, a continuous loop water and we're not there yet and it's going to take some work but we know uh, and that's not touching you know CO2 which we will have uh, regulations at some point coming in and are we preparing for that yes are we positioning our our our, uh, our capital additions etc so that we can accommodate what we think may be that but again uh, just the capturing type of equipment where that number I threw at 150 that's probably peanuts uh, compared to that and uh, so th those are going to be challenges for us, but nevertheless, that's what we will do. Uh, that's important to us. One of the four core principles of our refiner refinery is around protection of the environment. And, uh, you know, we're going to make the most prudent investments we can. But as long as our members are in the business out there, we're going to be supplying them. And if we're not supplying them, I, I know there's a lineup to take the product uh, that we have because we don't see the transition. There's a lot of development going on. From, from gas and diesel isn't going to happen in the next 5, 10 or 15 years. It's, it's, it's out there on any large uh, uh, basis. So does that mean we're not watching what's going on particularly with natural gas? That's you know, the biggest one. We know the government of BC, for example, has put in massive uh, incentives for anyone who can come up with the, uh, with the natural gas engine to replace diesel and they're, they're working on that with a couple specific groups. So, so um, you know, even if we're not uh, conscious of it, uh, the markets, uh, and, and, and rightly so, as we try and build a more sustainable planet, are going to cause us, even if uh, some of us don't want to, to, to be more mindful of that. I don't have the answer as to where we will be positioned in the long term, but there is no reason, again, as a community-based organization that operates and lives, works, and plays in our communities that we shouldn't be front and center on, uh, on sustainability issues. That's an excellent last sentence, don't you think? <laughs> that was just such an excellent, I watched the show called The Closer. That was a great closer. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of both co-ops, which is this gift, and the Edward School of Business, which is that gift, it's my privilege to thank you for a very interesting afternoon. And to invite everybody to please join us in a reception. I'm sure that there's a lot more questions. Um, I noticed that we have some faculty members here from Edwards who, um, and from other colleges who are certainly capable of teaching the co-op message, the co-op model, uh, co-op uh, values, co-op thinking. And we're all going to be watching for that rollout of the 2013 new branding. But I know that the reason that our many, many students who co-op with you they just know you're a good employer, right? So, you know, why do I want to go to Federated Co-op? Not because of the co-op model, because it's going to look good on my resume. Why? Because it's a big, recognizable company in, in the province, and that's what they want. They want that value. So it's we'll up to you. We'll be pleased to give it to them. And you do.